Good. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to uh, interventional medical image processing. And just a uh, just a remark. So uh, next Tuesday, we will have the test exam, and uh, we will hand them out in the beginning, and we will do 60 minutes of um, test exam. So this will be also the same circumstances under which you will be writing the real exam. And after that, uh, we will also present the results of the exam. So we will go through the correct solutions. And then you can correct for yourself whether you knew it or not. And uh, I hope that you uh, can learn something from that. And it's, it's, I hope it's a good preparation for the real exam, that you can expect what kind um, of tasks will, uh, you will have to do in the real exam. OK, good. Um, so today we want to talk about a variational calculus. And this is something which will come in really handy when we are talking about non-rigid registration. So non-rigid registration will use variational calculus. And let's I will try to introduce this very slowly and I will try to um, connect the variational calculus with, with what you already know um, from theory and um, uh, from, from gradient theory and uh, root this in something you are very familiar with and then just uh, I think uh, some of you or many of you should already know this but I think it's a good thing to repeat it and go through it uh, very carefully and we will introduce the, the variations uh, calculus of variations then we will uh, actually derive or show the Euler Lagrange equation which is a very important concept here and um, then we will look into a couple of examples which are well, very very basic ones and also a very interesting one we will look into curves of minimal length and uh, in the end we will also talk about uh, generalization to higher uh, to higher dimensions and higher order derivatives yeah. in the end we have a short example on how you can actually use that for image denoising Okay, good. So let's go back to, um, uh, let's go to a problem that we typically want to solve in image processing. And one problem could be we want to smooth an image. And we want to define a function that describes somehow um, how a, an optimal image should look like and what properties it should have. And derived from this function, we look for the image that optimally fits these criterions. And for example, we could model um, that a filtered image G uh, should be as similar as possible to the original image F. And another thing that we can say, well, we want to smooth the image, so it should be smooth at the same time. So this is the two assumptions that I want to plug into an objective function. And here we can do that. And here we can see we can define an objective function D and D it depends on F and G. So F is the input image and G is the smoothed image. And uh, later on we can change G. Now what we, what we put in here is we have uh, typically something like a similarity measure. So the first thing that we um, point out is that if we take F and we take D and subtract the two and then take the square, uh, it should be not a too high value. So we want F and G to be close. So this is a very typical similarity measure and you've seen this already a couple of times in the class. And then what we also want to have in our smoothed image, so in G, we want the gradient to be small. And we can take uh, generally some p-norm, uh, but in for the time being we can also just take um, L2 norm. So this is how you would construct such an objective function and this objective function we want to uh, optimize. So in this term, in this case, we want to minimize this. Now, what you can see here is um, we, we again use a regularizer like we typically do that to in order to have, because we have multiple criteria that we want to find out or multiple criteria that we want to fulfill at the same time and therefore we put in such a regularization parameter mu and in this case um, mu can be uh, user selected and the user says how important the 
data fit compared to the smoothness is. And if you over-regularize, you will get very smooth images and it doesn't fit the data as well anymore. And if you have a very small parameter, um, you will get a very good data fit. So if you set mu to zero, you will get uh, exactly f because f has uh, no, the f minus f will be zero. Okay, so these are the typical problems that we look at in image processing. And remember this isn't, so we are going towards registration now, but the example here is a denoising, is an image smoothing problem. Yeah? Keep that in mind. Good, so well the problem that we have now is we want to minimize this functional d and d is now a function that is dependent on other functions. So technically f and g are also functions. So what we want to do is we want to take this function now that is dependent on functions and we want to minimize it with respect to the function g. And how can we do that? Well the solution is the calculus of variations. So this is you can optimize a functional with respect to a function which is very useful. So before that we were always explicitly modeling the function and were directly deriving this. So for example we were expressing f and g with vectors and then you were optimizing for a specific vector. But now we interpret this as a function and then we can also imply constraints um, on the specific function. And we, so if you decide for having a vector notation just for having a grid with values, then you already explicitly cho chose a specific type of function. So let's say I have a different way of describing um, an image and I could describe an image for example using polynomials, I could use it, uh, I could describe it with sine and cosine functions and so on. So there's plenty of ways how I can describe an, an image or how I could parameterize an image. And if I do this here, uh, I can already uh, compute a minimal solution or constraints for a minimal solution and I have not set the explicit modeling of our function at this point, which is a um, very elegant way of solving this. And I can defer the decision to which model to choose to a later point in time. So I can already derive constraint for constraints for a specific problem and then choose for a B-spline uh, implementation. So in registration, we will often have the, the question how to actually model the deformation and um, typically uh, there's many ways of modeling this and uh, very common ones are of course uh, B-splines but also directly vector fields. And a vector field is a, is a complete volume where you have um, a vector at every volume, at every voxel element you have a vector and it's also a 3D vector and it describes the motion at this specific, at this specific point. And of course if you have a large volume and you have a vector space you have a very uh, large amount of data that you have to process. And then if you choose for example B splines, B splines you only describe with control points that are sampled over the volume but it's not as dense as the entire grid. So it has much fewer parameters and it's intrinsically smooth and so on. So there's a, a couple of advantages for a specific parameterization over another and uh, here at this point we are not deciding this. So we are only deriving the properties that um, the solution must have with respect to our uh, optimization problem. Okay, so in order to now derive or introduce the calculus of variations, we will go back uh, into our basic optimization theory and we will try to point out the similarities between what you are already used to in optimization theory and what the extension and the a variational calculus is. So far when we were optimizing something we were looking essentially into derivatives and then we were looking for stable points where the derivative in all directions is zero. And the first thing that we have to rethink about here is how did we actually define derivatives and if we had a function that is dependent on x, the derivative with respect to x we defined as the limit using some variable epsilon and we were uh, approaching zero very closely and then we were varying the function with respect to x 
uh, and we were adding a small constant epsilon and then we subtract at the position f of x and we divide by e and this way we were able to find or to to formalize uh, the derivative with respect to a certain point now we can do the same in a uh, in a vector valued function and in a vector valued function we typically uh, define uh, vectors and then we can do the same trick so we have have a direction u so this is now the gradient with respect to the direction u and here we can take the vector x and add um, u which is the um, let's say a unit vector and in a particular direction and then we add a small amount of this unit vector which will then give us a directional derivative with respect um, to the direction u and we can also write this in shor short form um, as a partial derivative of uh, f x plus epsilon u and uh, we denote that the epsilon should actually be zero uh, so this is one way how we can um, define or, or denote uh, directional derivatives we are looking at this in quite some detail because we will now expand these concepts into functions so we want to do very similar things but instead of using vectors we want to use functions so um, and of course what we also have to think about is where do we have a minimum and uh, let's say we have a real valued function then this function will have a minimum if the gradient uh, at the position x, um, x star um, is zero uh, so in all directions we have to have uh, a zero partial derivative okay this and uh, if our uh, f is strictly convex our minimum will be unique this is also something that we can uh, already recap uh, recapture re rethink about good so now we have uh, found some well we already know this uh, that these are conditions of course for a, for a minimum and we're using this all the time when we seek to optimize uh, a specific problem we are computing derivatives um, on gradients and set them to zero so we've been doing this in this class all the time now in variational calculus we will have a real valued function now and now the function now maps a function uh, from c2 to real numbers uh, so now f is a function so it's no longer just just a vector x but it's going to be a function and we have a functional that takes this function and maps it to some real value uh, now if f um, uh, if f0 is a minimum of the functional then f0 uh, has to satisfy the corresponding euler lagrange equation and we will derive the euler lagrange equ equation in the following and you will note that the condition so a necessary condition for having a minimum here is that um, the euler lagrange equation is fulfilled and we will realize very shortly that the euler lagrange equation is essentially the expansion of this equation into a functional uh, re uh, representation so here the we had the, the gradient uh, at the position is exactly zero and we will find that the res respective euler lagrange equation will also take a very similar form and um, we will then use the Euler Lagrange equations in order to find minima of a functional with respect to a specific function. Good. Uh, if F0 is a unique minimum, then, um, F or, uh, then the functional of F is strictly convex. This is also a very similar observation that we will, uh, that you can derive as in the, the math that you are already used to good so let's have a look at uh, a typical optimization problem here now our functional uh, is is actually uh, defined as an integral from some starting point x1 to some endpoint x2 and we have this 
uh, f here, and f is dependent on x, f, and f prime. And here you can see that we slightly abuse notation because uh, f and f prime actually uh, denote the derivative, but at the same time uh, we use these two symbols also as the second and third variable of the function f. Uh, so this is a slight uh, abuse of notation, but um, it will help us to go through the math slightly better. And also, uh, I'm omitting quite a few things. Yeah? So uh, actually, what you could also do is, so here, if these are the function, right, it should be f of x and f prime of x. And I'm uh, uh, omitting the of x here just for shortness of notation. Otherwise, we will get very, very long um, uh, formulas here. And if we write it in this way, it will be much, uh, much shorter. And it's much nicer, so. And at the same time, we also uh, define, or we, we have to put in some, some kind of boundary conditions, and we say that the, at x1, we have the value f1, and f at the position x2 is going to be the value f2. Uh, this is, um, uh, these are the side constraints that we want to fulfill here. Good, so this is our optimization problem, and now we want to optimize it. And well, what can we do? Well, we need to um, find the, we need to find a condition that describes us an optimal position. And now the optimal position uh, with respect to this functional will be the Euler-Lagrange equation. And this will be the necessary condition for minimizing this functional, and it's gonna be f, derived with respect to f minus the total derivative um, of f derived with respect to f prime. Huh? Now we have a function that is dependent on functions and we can derive it uh, with respect to x and f and so on. Okay, good. And we introduced this notation, of course. Uh, so we had our function here and here we have the uh, partial derivative with respect to f and here we have the partial derivative with respect to f prime. Uh, of course, you can do that in a function. Good. So, let's see how we can actually derive this. So, we can actually derive the Euler Lagrange equation. Yes? Yeah, so so if you if you have a, a prime here, this means this is a derivative. And yeah, yeah and this is a, this is a partial derivative, yes. So f prime is the derivative with respect to x. But uh, in the equation above, yes. Uh, does it not mean that uh, the partial derivative of uh, f and partial derivative of f prime? Yes. No, here, here you're deriving with respect to, so if you take the partial derivative with respect to f prime, you're deriving uh, for this variable here. And if you take the partial derivative of f with respect to f, you're deriving uh, with respect to, um, to this variable. And so as above, the partial derivative of x? Yes. This is a total derivative. We, we, uh, we are deriving this now. This is a short form of writing this. We will, we will have a look into the total derivative later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, this is a very elegant and short way of describing uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation. Good. So now let's have a look how we can actually derive this. So what we can do is, um, previously we had this, this vector u, and u was giving us a direction. And now we can do something similar. Um, we will actually introduce something that we call uh, a perturbation function. And now this perturbation function, uh, we did define it in such a way that the boundary condition um, of the perturbation function is zero. So at x1 and x2, it's going to be zero. And it will have, uh, we will use uh, epsilon in order to scale um, the original, uh, in order to scale the amplitude. So this means we can do a small variation 
using epsilon and eta, and uh, this should not change the value of the function of too much. If we do that now, um, we can define, instead of having the original function, so we, you remember f and uh, f prime, these were the function that we seek to optimize for. Now we can introduce an, a set of functions g and g prime um, that are the original function, but we just add a little with our perturbation function. Okay, so this is essentially the idea that we add something with re respect to a specific functional direction. Yeah? And now if you take uh, the derivative, then you will realize uh, that the derivative uh, of this is going to be um, f prime um, and uh, times epsilon times eta prime. Yeah? So if we derive with respect to x, we will get the following derivative yeah? because they are just added and you can uh, derive them independently. And of course, both functions are dependent on x. Good. So now having introduced, so remember, g is essentially f, but we just add a little. And g prime is also, um, is also essentially f prime, but we just add a little. And the uh, other interesting part is, if you compute the partial derivative of this function here, or this function here, with respect to epsilon, uh, because later we might, uh, we will actually compute partial derivatives with respect to epsilon, um, then you will see that this part here vanishes. This part is independent of epsilon, and this part is independent of epsilon. So if we derive this with respect to epsilon, uh, only eta prime or eta will remain. Yeah? Okay. And then, of course, uh, the boundary conditions, uh, because we have to found the boundary conditions of eta to be uh, equal to zero, which means that uh, g will have the same boundary condition as f, which will be identical to f1, and on the other side it will be f2, uh, because our perturbation function is zero exactly at the boundary, which we put in here. Okay, good. So now we can try to find um, the, uh, the derivative um, with respect to our functional direction. And the functional direction um, you can will be eta. And we can do the same thing here. So we, we add a little eta to f of x. And then we subtract the original uh, value of the functional. Yeah. So f plus eta. Uh, um, epsilon eta minus the functional of uh, f will be our derivative. And what we want to find is also that this derivative should be equal to zero. Good. So once we do that, then you can, um, you can just plug in our definition of the functional which is going to be the integral from x1 to x2 over f of x, uh, g, and g prime. And now you realize that this is uh, independent of epsilon, so you can pull in the uh, derivative with respect to epsilon, you can pull it inside here. And in the next step, you can actually compute the derivatives with respect uh, to epsilon. And here you will get uh, f derived with respect to g times eta of x. Yeah? So this is the derivative uh, of g, and this is with respect to epsilon, and this is the derivative of g prime with respect to epsilon. And here you get uh, f of g prime uh, as the other part. So this is just deriving this function with respect to epsilon. Then you get this here. Okay, what else can we see? Well, uh, we, can, uh, we can see that we actually want to have uh, epsilon to be zero. And if we set epsilon to be zero, then g will just be converted into f. So we can replace all occurrences with g. We can replace with the respective occurrences in f. Okay. So, yeah, if you set epsilon to zero, 
eta will cancel out and um, g becomes f and g prime becomes f prime. This is what we did here. Okay, now we have some, some kind of function where we have um, eta and eta prime in here and we want to get rid of the eta and what we can do now is um, we can remember that we can do a partial integration of the second term by using the rule up here. So if you have an integral from a to b of u times the derivative of v with respect to x and you integrate over x, then this is identical to the integral function which would be u times v at the position a and b, sampled here, minus a, the, the integral from a to b of u prime times v. And we can use exactly the same relation on the right hand side of this um, integration. So what we do is we, we integrate, um, we have the integral from x1 to x2 over this term here, then we can build the integral function which will be nothing else than f prime f times eta. So this is going to be our integral function and now we come back to our boundary constraints and the boundary constraints said that eta um, uh, of x1 and x2 is zero. And if eta of, uh, so you sample at two positions only here, and at both positions eta is zero, which means that this entire term here will cancel out. Now if you have that, then you can see that this is just um, a, 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 the only part that remains is minus the integration from uh, x1 to x2, and here you have the derivative of f of f prime with respect to x times eta x and you integ uh, integrate over x. Now we can plug this back into our original formulation and you can see we um, converted our eta prime into eta. And now because we have eta prime converted into eta, we can see that we have this term here dependent on eta and this term is dependent on eta because we converted it. So we can actually pull out the eta here and we have only this part here f of f minus the total derivative of f of f prime multiplied with eta and integrated over the entire domain of x. So if you do that, um, you can also uh, you can use the fundamental lemma of a variational calculus which says if you integrate from a to b of the multiplication of two functions and you have the boundary conditions um, uh, and you have those boundary conditions then the entire function uh, g needs to be zero which means um, all of g of x and g of x is only this part, yeah, and this is not either, this is the remaining part, all of g of x needs to be zero. And this brings us exactly to the Euler-Lagrange equation. Yeah. So we have just derived the Euler-Lagrange equation. So if we are looking for a minimum in our functional, yeah, if we are looking for a minimum in our functional, this is uh, identical than fulfilling, uh, as fulfilling the Euler-Lagrange equation where we only have our part, our, our function that is dependent on, uh, the with respect, derived with respect to f minus the total derivative of f derived with respect to f prime equals to zero. Now this is, this is nice um, because we can now use this in order to compute derivatives of functionals very efficiently and very quickly and we can find stable points and functionals very nicely. Good. So let's, let's take as a specific functional and now we consider a functional uh, that, has the, 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 that has this f and now f uh, is x times f of x to the power of 5 plus f prime of x to the power of 2. 
And now we can actually compute those um, partial derivatives with respect to f. And all you need to do is you take everything that is dependent on f and just apply your traditional uh, rules how you compute a derivative. So you decrease this number by 1 and multiply with this number. So we have 5 times x times f of x to the power of 4. And this part here vanishes because this part is not dependent on f but only dependent on f prime. Yeah, you can you can use them as, as additional variables. Yeah? You can think of them here and when you compute the derivation as uh, additional variables. And we can do the same with respect to f prime, and the only part that is dependent on f prime is this one here. So you get two times f prime uh, of x. And what I still have to do in this case is I have to apply the total derivative, and you can expand this term here into a partial, a partial derivative of f of, uh, derived with respect to f prime, with respect to f, uh, with respect to x, plus the partial derivative of this term with respect to f and multiply it with f prime plus the partial derivative of f prime uh, of the uh, functional uh, of f with respect to f prime uh, multiplied with f second order derivative. Okay. So instead of doing the implicit form here, you could also write this short form notation where you had f derived with respect to f minus uh, f f prime and x f f prime f times f prime minus f uh, f prime f prime and f second order derivative. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. The total derivative regards that f is actually dependent on x, and f prime is also dependent on x. This is why you uh, come up with this total derivative. So you have to regard this in here. Good. So now we can also see this explicit form, and you note the, the similarity uh, of our traditional gradient methods. So if we didn't have any parts that are dependent on f prime and f f prime, then we would just have the derivative uh, of f with respect to f. Now, this is, this is something you should really have a look at. So this is a very nice example how you can, uh, where you can have a look at, and this is also something that I would practice uh, for the written exam. Uh, something that looks like this, that you are able to compute the partial derivatives uh, of such functionals. Yeah. Good. What else? Well, let's go to a slightly uh, more complicated case. And uh, the case that we want to look at is we want to find a function f. And this function f should be the shortest length corresponding to two points x1 um, uh, the corest, the, corest, uh, the shortest length connecting two points, um, x1, y1, uh, x2, y2. Yeah. And we can do that in order, uh, if we want to do that, first of all we have to think about what is the distance between two points. And in fact you can find many definitions of distance depending on the space that you're operating in. Yeah. So let's say you had you had a distance on a sphere and you're computing the distance along the surface of the sphere, then you will have a different distance than you just have in Euclidean space. And here we will just um, stick to, to a Euclidean definition and we can actually define that um, the, uh, that the length um, of our distance here that, um, is going to be the uh, x square plus y square. And of course this is also valid uh, if we only look at very short path lengths. Yeah? So we can sa uh, sample a short path length and it will tell us that this short segment uh, will be dependent on uh, x squared plus y squared. 
And here we only take very small steps. Yeah? If we only take very small steps, delta steps, then we can uh, this uh, definition also holds. Now we can reformulate this a bit, and we can um, pull out the x. So you um, divide uh, over over x square here, and pull it out, and then you uh, you get this definition here. Yeah? So if I divide here with uh, with x square, it's inside the square root. Then I need to multiply with x on the outside in order to cancel it out. This is just a small um, a small uh, reformatting here, because if we do that, you can see that this is essentially um, a property of the derivative of the function f. So now we can define a function now that. And we reduce this uh, to the limit, and our our uh, functional is dependent on f, and where f is the function describing the distance, uh, where f is the function def uh, describing the path. Sorry, f is the function describing the path, and uh, f prime is the property of of length that we have encoded here. Uh, so now we want to find the essentially the integral over all the small steps uh, along our path and the integral over the small steps should be minimal. This would also be um, an inter interpretation of this function. Good, so our integrand in this function is of course the inner part, so our capital F is going to be uh, the square root of 1 plus um, F prime square. And now we can compute the derivative with, re with respect to f, which is of course zero, because there is no f popping up here, so f doesn't doesn't appear here. And then we can also compute the derivative with respect to f prime, and uh, you get this solution. Good. So now that we have found uh, ff and ff prime, then we can go back to our Euler-Lagrange equation and we put it in into our Euler-Lagrange equation. And here uh, we see that the first part um, disappears because this was zero, so only the total derivative with respect to x remains here. And this is going to be zero. And now we can do another trick. So we know this, this thing here uh, derived with respect to x is going to be zero which means that the original function, where we didn't take the derivative, so this function here, uh, has to be a constant c. If the derivative of this, of this function here is zero, then the integral function has to be a constant. Yeah? So then we can just go to the integral function, and the integral function will be some constant c. Now this is an equation that is in, uh, that you can solve for f prime. Uh, so we have, we got rid of f, we know that there is um, a constant c in here, so we can actually uh, solve it for f prime, and if you solve it for f prime, you can uh, rearrange it to be c divided by the square root of 1 minus c square. Okay, and now we realize c is a constant, which means that the derivative of f of x is also a constant. And if we have a function that has a constant derivative, then, um, well, f of x has to be an affine function in x, which means it has to be something like mx plus t, and surprise, surprise, we've just shown that f of x is a straight line. Okay, interesting, yeah. We just proved that the connection, the shortest path between two points, using this particular distance um, measure is a line. Surprise, surprise. That's it, what we did. Okay? Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> so now you see why this is uh, extremely useful. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't, we, we could actually prove that the shortest uh, distance between two points is a line. Isn't that nice? Yeah, of course, this will also work for any other distance measure. Yeah, you can also uh, provide, um, you can also provide um, 
properties of a distance measure in that is uh, defined in a different way. Yeah. So this is really useful. Yeah. Just just imagine that you want to com uh, compute the the shortest connection between two points on a, a curved surface or something. Then you can also use this. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well. We can also expand this to higher order derivatives and maybe we want to imply some constraints that do not only affect f and f prime, but we might want to have uh, also constraints on second order derivatives. Let's say uh, we want to imply something on curvature, then we can also do this. And if you do that, and this is something that is interesting, this is for you to know, this is something that is interesting for you, uh, and this is something you can look up on the slides or you can also look up in, in a good math book. But uh, this is something we won't discuss uh, in the written exam. Yeah? So we won't uh, discuss higher order derivatives in the, in the exam. Uh, don't worry. But uh, I it, may quite, uh, it may actually occur that you have a problem that you need to solve that is really dependent on higher order derivatives and then you can go back to the slides and see how it scales up. And the thing is, um, these these partial uh, derivatives with respect uh, to eta and the second order derivative and so on, uh, you will also get rid of with using this trick with the with the partial integration. Yeah. You remember we had the integral function and then we could switch from eta prime to eta, and then we could uh, take out eta. We have to do it in a nested way, so. Uh, this will then uh, result in this alternating sign. So you have f of f prime and then the total derivative of uh, f of um, f prime. So f of f minus the total derivative of f of f prime. And then you have the total uh, derivative squared uh, of f of f prime prime and so on. And then you have an alternating sign because we're pulling out either. Yeah. So now you can already prove this, yeah, how this would work. So you could go back and just derive a formal proof for every specific configuration. Good. No, this won't be a... This, this would be an excellent question for the written exam, wouldn't this be? Yeah, you can... It would be... Yeah, just prove it. So we, we, we provide you the proof for the f of f prime case and then you get f of f prime prime and you derive it. No, we're not going to do this in the written exam. Yeah. I was tempted, but then I decided not to do it. So <laughs> okay, and another thing that's interesting is uh, you can also uh, create dependence uh, with function f1, f2, and so on. So if you have several functions, then you can scale up as follows. You will get one Euler-Lagrange equation for every specific function. Uh, so if you have several functions that you seek um, uh, to optimize, then you will get specific uh, Euler-Lagrange functions for every individual function. So we derive as many equations as we, as we have functional dependencies. Good. So then let's go to a case that is uh, quite typically of interest for us. That would be image processing. And here our function is no longer a 1D function. So we, we just had always x. But typically our functions are dependent on x and why. So how will this change our problem? Well, uh, it will blow up to f of x, y, and then f, and then f partial derivative with respect to x, and f partial derivative with respect to y. Uh, because we suddenly have a 2D problem. And then, uh, of course, these are the partial derivatives. So we are using the short form again, which makes everything much easier. And uh, of course, we don't have any uh, just one two boundary points, but now we have a, a boundary region and we're integrating over an entire region. Good. And if we do that, we end up with an Euler-Lagrange equation for the 2D, 2D case, which will be f of f minus the partial derivative with respect to x of f of x, f, f, x and uh, minus the partial derivative with respect to y of f, f, y. Good. And this can be derived similarly to the 1D case. And of course, you then need a 2D perturbation function if you want to derive this. 
also a very interesting candidate for the written exam, but we are not going to ask for it. <laughs> Maybe as a bonus task, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have 60 minutes, and then this is like a five minute bonus task. And yeah, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, now we go back to our original formulation. Yeah, now everybody knows variational calculus here, and we can go back to our original problem where we had the problem we wanted the image to be similar and smooth at the same time. And then, of course, uh, we can reformulate this a bit. So, see, I'm omitting all the x's now. Yeah. Uh, we only have f and g, but of course they're dependent on um, x and y. And we uh, can now um, plug this together. Uh, actually, this part here stays the same, but with our gradient and the two norm, we can split this actually, um, uh, we can directly apply the two norm where we have um, a gx square and gy square. And now we end up with this kind of function and we have to imply the previous constraints. Good, now we can compute the partial derivatives. So you see here we have the partial derivatives of f of f, f of, um, f of fx and f of fy. And if we do that here it will be f of g and f of g will be uh, g minus f. Then we have, oh yeah, note that there's a 1 over 2 here. Yeah? There's, there's a 1 over 2 here, and we also plug it in here. But because if we do that, the 2 nicely cancels out. And then we have the uh, derivative with respect uh, to gx, and also the 2 cancels out nicely, so we only have mu gx, and in uh, f with respect to gy, we have mu gy. Good. And then we can also plug this back into our Euler-Lagrange equation, where we then have, um, we go back to the notation with the x's and y's, because um, we will have derivatives with respect to x and y. So here we have g x y minus f x y, which was uh, f with respect to g. And then we have the partial derivative with respect to x, and the partial derivative with respect to y. And we can actually see that this will be a derivative of gy with respect to y. And we can write this as gyy. And we can also take a gx partial derivative with respect to x. So this will become gxx. And we pull out the mu and uh, uh, replace this by the Laplacian. Uh. Where's the plus coming from? Hmm? Where's the, the plus coming from? So because we pull out the minus one. So the plus is because we're pulling out minus mu. What's this? this is minus mu, and this yeah, contains so minus mu. You mean this one, this one should flip. No, no. You're pulling out minus mu, so this minus will turn into a plus, and this minus oh, will yeah, turn yeah, into a plus, a, yeah. and yeah. this is a minus here. Yeah. Yeah. If you multiply yeah. this in, ah, uh, you you were missing one of the brackets yeah. here. Okay, yeah, yeah. So no, this is, yeah. yeah. There is, but are these brackets correct? Yeah, yeah. 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 G of x. Yeah. Okay, they're correct. Yeah, this bracket is not in the line before. Okay. Good. And there you go. This is the euler rockland equation for this case. Um, also not part of the written exam. Just as a hint. Good. So the euler lagrange equation cont uh, includes partial derivatives of the unknown function g of x, g of xy. Yeah. So g of xy is unknown. And we have still partial derivatives of g of xy in here. And typically, we solve this with a um, uh, with a numerical in a numerical way. Yeah. So these partial differential equations we use uh, in a numerical way. 
And for example, you could discretize it uh, using finite difference uh, approximation, and then you can get a linear system of equations if you do that. Just as a hint, because uh, you still have to solve this equation here. Yeah. Good. Um, a note on the boundary conditions. Um, if you have uh, at the boundary, so if you define the normal vector of your boundary as n, then at the boundary, uh, if you derive with respect to the normal direction, uh, the derivatives should be zero. Yeah? So you want to have a smoothness at the boundary. So you do not want to up. So let's say you have an image, and uh, of course at the boundary you have to do something about the boundary. Yeah? So one thing um, that you typically enforce is that you have a, 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 a constant a normal. Uh, so yeah, which which means that the derivative. So if you do that, uh, the derivative has to vanish at the boundary regions. And typically, you do that by mirroring. So if you have a function, um, an image, and you uh, have to exceed it for your numerical computation, you just mirror the image uh, over the boundary, and then you will have um, a smooth transition. This is a typical way of solving this. Good. Uh, we can also uh, connect this to linear diffusion. And uh, for linear diffusion, the Euler-Lagrange equation is the following here. So it's uh, gxx and gyy, uh, g minus f over mu. And you can interpret this. So this is our Euler-Lagrange equation, right? So we just had this Euler-Lagrange equation. And of course, you can divide uh, by mu. Then you get g minus f uh, minus gxx minus gyy. And if you rework this a bit, you end up with this equation. And you can interpret this, this solution as a steadied state. Yeah? So this is, uh, is a diffusion. Um, is, a, yeah, is the steady state of linear diffusion. And uh, in order to reach the state, you can, uh, you can apply a diffusion over several time steps. And if you do that, then uh, the, the discretized uh, biased linear diffusion process uh, can find you a gradient descent method for minimizing our previous functional, which is uh, essentially a, a diffusion process, a diffusion problem that you solve here. Now, nonlinear diffusion, so what the previous process does, uh, it will blur over edges because it doesn't if you have, uh, if you have a blur over, uh, you will blur over the edges. But you can also do a nonlinear diffusion, where you replace the smoothness turn with a potential function, and um, then this potential function penalizes large uh, gradients less severely. So, this is a kind of uh, potential function that you put in here, and uh, if you have a large gradient, then it will be uh, not penalized as much. And this is called the poirot potential. And we can also ignore the similarity term here in this case. Good. If we do that, we can also, so if we ignore the uh, similarity term, you remember the f minus g square, then you can also just minimize to the with respect to the poirot potential. And if you do that, uh, you can find um, uh, you can find the required partial derivatives and if you do so uh, you can find a d uh, you can find a edge preserving type of uh, denoising filter yeah and here is the respective euler lagrange equation where you then have the divergence uh, the divergence of the gradient in here just a note uh, you can go back now to the original Perun paper and read through the, the entire paper to see this. Good. Let's uh, have a look at some take-home messages. Um, so we found that we can formulate the image processing problem as a variational problem if we are optimizing directly for a specific function. And we have looked into the 
uh, Euler-Lagrange um, differential equation, and we found that the Euler-Lagrange differential equation gives us um, a condition that has to be met for a specific minimum. So we can use this condition and um, uh, already de derive those constraints and then uh, use them to derive our solution. And still we have to numerically solve the partial differential equation then. And we looked at a couple of examples, um, just as a hint. I find uh, this example particularly meaningful to look at, that you know how to, uh, for, for a given rather simple functional, that you derive the Euler-Lagrange equation. And uh, a f uh, an example that was very nice is uh, this that we actually derived that the shortest connection between two points is a line, which is also a very nice example, but we're not gonna... Yeah, it's, it's, it's something you should definitely have a, a look at. It's, it's, it's an interesting example. Yes? Yes? Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, with convexity, you have a unique solution. You have to think about that, if that's a convex function. Yeah, no. Is yeah, it's concave. Mm -hmm. Well, one minus a concave function is convex. <laughs> no, but you could optimize it uh, in, instead of... Yeah, 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 yeah. You're omitting the similarity term, exactly. Good. Uh, we have a couple of further readings. Um, there's many standard books on variational calculus, uh, if you want to read more about that. And then you could have a look at um, mathematical problems in image processing, partial differential equations, and the calculus of variations, and an invitation to variational methods in differential equations. Also, two nice books. Okay, more questions so far? Then um, we will, I think we are, no, we are done for today. And uh, in the next lecture on Tuesday, we will do the test exam. So now we have covered all of the contents that will be relevant for the test exam. Remember, this is the test exam. And there's a couple of more lectures to follow, which might be also relevant for the exam. Yeah? So this just because we're doing the net text, uh, test exam next week, it doesn't mean that everything that's going to be in the full exam will... Uh, so there is no 100% overlap, of course. There might be more questions, uh, more uh, problems. Yes? Uh, I think we can skip the recording next Tuesday. If you're interested in the test exam, and the solutions, we will also put it on our website. So if you say, I don't need the pressure to go in there, write for 60 minutes, and then people just show me the solutions on, on the projector, then you can also skip next lecture and uh, just download the solutions and the, the questions from, from the internet. We will put it on the website. Okay, good.